Thank you everybody for attending this talk today on constructing consensus. My name is Darko Vukovic and I'm a product manager with 12 years of experience in product management. I've been at a variety of companies, uh, started off at Microsoft. I've worked at Riot Games, Barnes and Noble, um, Okta, MuleSoft, Oracle, and currently I'm at Google uh, working on the Apigee and AppSheets uh, products. So I wanted to pick a topic that I felt like was very impactful for product managers, something that I've seen over the course of my career so far um, as something that is extremely valuable and extremely impactful. Uh, but it is going to be a little bit advanced and a little bit theoretical at times. So um, I hope that you guys could follow along and I'll make sure to really stress the pragmatic takeaways that I hope you can uh, take with you and apply to your career as you go on as product managers. So why build consensus? Why is this important in general? So the answer is because magnificent pieces of work, whether it be art or science, they take thousands of people working together in uniform and uniform meaning in, in the same direction. And sometimes it takes decades. So if you look at you know, things like building a cloud platform, for example, um, there are likely hundreds of thousands of hours that go into it. And just you know, some of these things can take uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, and this has historically always been the case. And so if you are to make something magnificent, if in your career you want to be part of something great, then knowing how to get people to work together in a shared consensus is gonna be extremely important. So to build great things, we must first create a common census, something that makes sense. And I'll explain what that is in, in a moment here as we go. Then we must embody it, which means to have that census transcend into us as human beings and allow our bodies to be vehicles for that sense to then work through us uh, in a structure, meaning that we collaborate together in some structure to then manifest that census as a physical, tangible thing. So this, this one sentence is effectively the crux of what I think is uh, important to do as a product manager. And so this is what the whole focus is gonna be is just this one sentence and, and breaking this down in a more tangible, consumable way. Now, why should you specifically learn to do it? Because this skill, the ability to create consensus is in desperate shortage, I would say in all disciplines, but specifically in product management. And I think most of the people in the industry are totally unaware of what we're even gonna be talking about here today. So I really think that if you learn to do this, you're gonna become a much better PM because you're gonna be able to deliver 10 times more value, 10 times faster, and your success rate of being able to succeed with projects is gonna go up potentially to a point where every time you pick up a project, if you determine that there is a consensus, if you can build that consensus, then almost always your project is going to be successful. And what you choose to do with this reward by becoming a more powerful PM, that's up to you. So if you decide you wanna you know, apply it to have more time off, if you wanna you know, use it as an opportunity to earn more, or if you wanna just have a more stress-free and relaxed life, that's all great. These are all things that you can, you know, how you cash in on uh, being a better PM and being, you know, way more productive. So to make this tangible, let's look at an example. Say you and three friends are out camping in the woods and you start to feel that it's getting cold. Okay. And so some, one of your friends says, Hey, let's build a fire. So at this point, you might say, great, I'm cold, a fire would be nice. And you might presume that everybody is in the same boat. And maybe even if all of your friends agree, 
that, hey, yeah, we should make a fire, you might think that, okay, we have achieved consensus. But it, it might not be so. I mean, just because multiple people agree to something, that doesn't mean that you have a consensus. And this is, this is the crux of it, because many times people agree to proceed forward, but the underlying consensus is not there. And that could be more dangerous than a disagreement happening at this stage. So as we kind of break down this thing, let's see where we're at. So constructing is derived from Latin and it means with structure. And consensus is also a Latin term and it means with sense. So what does that mean? Well, with sense, if you look at what making sense or sense is as a word, it has four major categories. So it's a thought, and these are some uh, related words to a thought. So it could be an idea, a belief, a concept or a conception, a conviction, opinion, a view, an image. And the word that I found most relevant in the product domain is you hear people talk about vision. So sense, having sense is having a vision. That's one core aspect of it. A second core aspect of it is feeling. So you sense something. So that could be like love, care, passion, fondness, adore, desire. And the word for me that really stuck out here is desire. People have to desire what you want. So they have to have the vision of the fire in this case, and they have to have a desire for the fire. It's not just enough to have a thought. Um, a lot of times in, in product management, you come up with ideas and people say, oh, that's a great idea, right? But they don't desire it. And especially when you're uh, working with customers or doing market research or analysis, especially in the product market uh, fit, when you're trying to make sure a product or a feature is going to make sense, you have to look for that desire because if the desire is not there, it doesn't make sense to do it. A third word is perception. Uh, this is also very important. This is having a, a attention or an attitude to it or, or a consciousness. That's the word that really stuck out at me here. This is being basically aware of your surroundings and making sure that your perception of your surroundings is accurate, that you have a degree of consciousness around what's happening because many times people might say, hey, you know, I have this uh, thought, it's to build a fire, right? And I would love to have a fire. So you're, 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 you're almost there. But then the attitude of some member might be, I don't wanna do any work, or uh, you might be in an area where fires are not allowed, or there might not even be the appropriate ingredients to have a fire, or maybe it's extremely windy. And so you're, you're introducing a risk. So having a great perception of what's happening um, to really understand if you're understanding the situation correctly is extremely important in being able to build a consensus as well. And then, you know, it has to be rational because it doesn't make sense if it is not realizable or rational or can't be turned into something. So the word here that really stuck out to me, I mean, a lot of these did, but the one that hit me the most is realistic. Because many times people will have an idea, let's say, oh, I'd love to have, you know, a flying car, but if it's not realizable, then it's not gonna be able to be manifested. And so you have to hit vision and desire and consciousness and realistic to have something that makes sense. And before you can even, before you hit these things, or sorry, before you start trying to embody this into other people, you have to make sure that you first see all four of these dimensions very clearly. And if you do, this is what creates a purpose. So if you come across an idea that you can imagine, that you want to realize, that's executable, it's realistic, you can actually make it happen, and you're conscious of the real problems at hand and the real motivations behind it, you're gonna end up with a purpose. And 
if you have a purpose, if the product has a purpose, then all of a sudden you are, you are going to be able to much more easily recruit others to find funding, to find, um, you know, tools and skills. And, and so everything is going to start to gravitate and I'll show you a slide on how it all comes together. But the key point from this slide here is be careful not to just get caught in one dimension. Make sure that when you think about changing the state of the existing world to something else, that transition is going to be your purpose in life. And to have that purpose, it has to make sense, which means that it has to hit all four of these dimensions. And then if it does, and if you now have a purpose, this is where the structure comes in. Because without a structure to realize that purpose, it's just going to be a motivating factor that doesn't get transcended from your mind into other people. Or maybe it's a great purpose, right? But if you can't assemble the structure of human beings working together to realize it, then you're going to be limited to only being able to create things that you can do alone. Or maybe you can get a few people that naturally line up with you. And so, you know, you have the small team of people that just are naturally aligned and maybe have the same purpose in life. But reality is that when you apply this in any major enterprise, um, you know, and then you start to think about the dependent enterprises that have to work together with you, you're going to realize that many of your projects, as you become more senior in the, in the PM space, there's going to be hundreds of people working on making things realize, realizable, realizing things, getting them built. So you, you have to have a structure to make it happen. Now, what, what is comprised in the structure? There's people, right? So there's how do you enroll people to participate with you in this purpose? Um, there's motivation, uh, getting people to, to see and want that same purpose. And then, you know, there's a relationship between the people, right? Um, there's the structure implies that there are multiple people and that they have some relationships with each other. And those relationships could be hierarchical um, or they could be lateral, right? So it could be that you have a UI designer who works with a UI developer. So you will have to think about that structure uh, and, and the people are a big piece of it. Uh, you have leadership. How are decisions being made? How are people held accountable for delivery? Um, how do you, you know, transition between the di different states inside uh, the project? There's a time dimension, a start, an end, different phases, different branches of, you know, pathways of how, you know, things are being delivered across a period of time. Uh, there's an architecture of what is that uh, end state going to look like. Uh, so this, you know, it comprises of what materials are going to go into it, in which ratios, what are going to be the arrangements of those materials, um, and then also what interactions should those things account for, um, you know, end user interactions, operator interactions. So there's an architecture that has to go into the structure as well. And then there's also economics, right? So there's an investment, uh, a result, a value, is this, um, is this change in the world that you're proposing, which is your purpose, does that end state produce more value than the cost it took to achieve that end state? And so all of this goes into structure and all of these could be a talk for, you know, all of these could be a series in how to do it well. And I'm hoping that, you know, other speakers are covering these things. But here I just wanted to outline that you have to have these five things uh, assembled in the right way across time for you to have the appropriate structure. So if we try to visualize all these concepts that I've outlined to put them into one picture here. So basically the idea is that you're in a current state. This is your world. And this is where that perception is extremely important because the way you see the world should be as true as possible to avoid a misrepresentation where because you didn't understand where you actually were, you ended up in, a, in the wrong state. Um, and also don't mess with things unless you can accurately 
understand where they are. A lot of mistakes come from just people uh, wanting to change things without really understanding why they want to make those changes. So then you have this imagined future state, right? So this is where somebody comes together and puts together a vision. And a vision could be simply explained as something different than today. That's a vision, right? So I'm you know, sitting here um, and it's getting cold and I have a vision of having a campfire. And so that's, that's, that's something that doesn't exist today that I'm imagining it could exist. And that vision has to then get qualified within those four different dimensions to become a census, right? Because I have to, maybe I want a fire because it's cold, but maybe somebody else wants a fire because uh, it's dark and somebody else wants a fire uh, because it just feels good to have a fire, even though they have plenty of clothes to stay warm. So that census is important to really get down across those four dimensions while you're still in the imagined future state. Because while things are in your imagination, it's extremely easy to modify them. It doesn't cost very much. You know, I can say, hey, instead of a fire, what about a jacket to stay warm? And it's like, that didn't cost me anything to adjust that future vision. So the more work you do at this point in time, the better because the cost of doing this work is free, effectively. And then once you finally built a census that you, are, uh, you, you, you and the group have become uh, embodied, basically. And what that means is that now that census is no longer just floating in the imaginary space. It's actually, we have had a, um, an embodiment of it, meaning that we now can feel it, right? So this is where human emotion comes into the picture. Like this is where you should be seeing people just visually excited about the idea, right? Your customers would say, oh, I would love if you can give me that, right? You hear emotional terms. So not, not terms that are uh, maybe, you know, oh, it would be good to have that, or I could see that be valuable, right? Like, no, you don't want that. You want words of endearment. Uh, you want words like, I would love to have it. I can't wait to, for it to be here. Um, this is something that would change my life, right? So just an emotional reaction to it. And your team members, you, sh you should notice that they're excited um, to make this a reality. And so that's the embodiment stage. This is where things are no longer just imaginary. They're starting to become tangibly present inside us as human beings. And this is where structure is born. So now, because you have humans that are starting to embody it, sure, you can have humans that are just embodying it independently, but here is where you start to now turn into uh, that embodiment into questions like, who's gonna do what to make this possible, right? So if we're building this campfire at this point, all of us really want it. And you could tell that we visually are excited by the idea of having one. But now the question starts to come, well, who's going to gather the wood? Who is going to uh, gather you know, uh, some straw or hay or something to start the initial flame? Where are we gonna get the lighter? Who's gonna manage the fire? Who's gonna assemble the logs? So all of these questions start to come in here where we start to ask what are our roles and what relationships do we need to have inside this project to make this possible. Who needs to work with whom? Who needs to do what? And that's the state at which you should then go start thinking about, well, which tools and materials would we need to realize this? Because things are starting to get physical here. So everything up at this point was just discussions, basically, or maybe a few charts to represent our, what we've achieved, or what we've decided. But at this point, when you start to introduce tools and materials, this is when things are actually starting to get real. And this is at which point you can start to say, okay, in what sequence of transformations would I take the current state with new inputs of tools and materials so that I can achieve a future state? And that sequence of transformations, that is your actual project plan. So that's the set of events that need to happen 
for you to achieve that future state. And here is where you know tools and materials start to actually, and you could argue that they, they are done together, uh, and I, I would buy that argument, where basically your sequence of transformations as you're thinking about them, this is where you start to select your tools and materials to be able to be applied in that sequence of transformations to achieve your future state. And so here, this is how your vision comes to reality. Uh, the, your vision goes through this stage of first be, becoming a consensus amongst the participants who then embody it because they want to realize it. And then by embodying it, they start to work together to figure out who's going to do what, who's going to work together on which things, which tools and materials are we going to use, what sequence of transformations are we going to need to take for us to end up in that future state. And this is where I, I layer in what's tangible and what's intangible. And again, do as much as you can in the intangible state, because this is a much cheaper place to make modifications, to get a drill in deeper, to state your assumptions, to test things. Um, it, it's really why we as human beings are able to be so, so successful is because we're the only animal that can manipulate a future vision and before we take any tangible actions. And that allows us to do all kinds of scenarios and permutations and debates before we expend precious resources to try and actually get there. And most PMs from what I've seen and leaders, they screw up usually in one of these two places. It's either that they don't build a coherent census and it just as an example, you know, you build something that would be great, customers would love it, it, would, it really would solve the current problems, but it's so cost prohibitive that you can't actually execute on it. Or, you know, you build something that's a great idea, uh, you know, and it, it, you know, you're not aware of the true nature of customers. And so when you go to adopt the product at the customer, it turns out that it doesn't plug in naturally to their ecosystem, therefore it can't be used. I've seen so many cases like that where somebody missed one of those four core dimensions and that ended up to basically leading to all this wasted effort because the future state was actually no better than the current state, even though it was different. Uh, so really make sure you nail it across all four of those dimensions. And then part two that I think people mess up quite often is the embodiment phase. So they don't appropriately help the team members that are going to be working on this project with them, they don't understand why they are truly doing what they're doing. Or you end up with situations where there is multiple motives and those motives don't align, but coincidentally, everyone wants to end state and then something changes along the way. Like let's say somebody said, hey, I'm gonna work on this project uh, because I, I think it's, this would be a great project for me to get a promotion if it succeeds. And then halfway through, let's say they see another opportunity to work on a different project and they get their promotion, right? And so now that person's, you know, embodiment of the census, it wasn't there. It was never, that person never was working on this project because they believed in that future state and they wanted to realize the future state, you know, or they had their own future state they wanted to realize, which had nothing to do with the vision for this project. So getting the team and anyone who works on the project to embody that same shared understanding and to have that same emotional desire for it to manifest is, is where I think most people blow it and their teams tend to not work efficiently together because they either don't understand what they're doing or don't have a shared vision and what they're trying to accomplish. So a simpler visualization, if that was too much, at least from this talk, I want you to walk away knowing that step one, you have to outline a purpose, right? If you don't have a purpose for why this future state is better than the current state, and you know, it's not, you know, uh, it's a, it's, you don't have a coherent vision that is tangible or that is executable, that, and your awareness of the current situation is not there, and you don't have an emotional reaction, your project's probably not gonna succeed, just straight up. So you have to have that purpose 
for why you're doing what you're doing. And then people have to really then uh, embody it. People have to have that shared purpose. And only then, step three, once you've embodied it, then people will naturally look for ways to say, they'll start asking questions like, what can I do to make this possible? And if you build a structure out of people who have embodied the purpose, that structure is going to be much easier to build because people are going to volunteer for work. They're going to self-organize rather than somebody sitting there and, and designing who's going to do what, right? So, so it's, a, it's a loosely distributed group of people finding their own connection points rather than an architect sitting down and defining who's supposed to work on what. So a bottoms up way of making it possible. And they're gonna be naturally okay with the structure because if you start as a person, if you say, hey, I'm good at you know, uh, UI development, it's gonna be natural for you to say, but I'm not good at design. So I'm gonna need to rely on somebody who is good at design. And so that's gonna form that structure naturally. And that person is gonna be you know, inherently ready to accept the work of the designer because they understand where their place is in the structure and who they have to work with. So then you build the structure. And then lastly, once you have a structure, then you build the product and you can't skip these steps. You can't, you know, people, you know, I've noticed they go at a project that has no purpose, no clearly stated purpose with a team uh, that don't share that same purpose, that have their own ulterior motives. Usually somebody you know, sits down in a room and quickly puts together a, a team structure of who's gonna report to who. And then there's all these organic touch points that are not set up naturally. And then finally, you, know, you get this product and, and it doesn't succeed. And generally nobody really goes back in time and figures out where exactly did this fall apart. So uh, most failed projects I've seen are products that didn't go through this and have a good step, a good success point at each step. So some advice on consensus, some pragmatic advice uh, is to make the genesis and the terminus of the vision into a short story. You're gonna have to explain what you're doing. If you're, if you're working on a sizable project, you're gonna have to explain hundreds of times what you're doing and why you're doing it and make sure that the Genesis story uh, accurately represents the truth and the circumstances and conditions of what is happening today. So it could be something like, you know, we, we were camping, we were cold, it was getting dark, so we decided to create a fire so that we would be warm and could see, right? Like that's a Genesis story. It, it be, it's painfully obvious why the world needs what you're proposing. And it's based on truth. And then the terminus is extremely important because you have to reach a logical conclusion to what you're doing. If you never achieve the future state, you're gonna lose that momentum. So you can always create another future state once you've hit your future state, but you want your goals to be achievable so that you can actually reach that conclusion and say, hey, we've succeeded. We now have light and we now have heat. And that's a great time to celebrate and to, and, and to be happy. And, and if you're able to tell the story of what that success is gonna look like when we reach it, you're gonna have a team that's much more motivated to keep pushing to get it. Instead of just saying, you know, our goal is to have more users and it's undefined and it, eventually that spirit starts to get lost because people don't have a good idea of what the terminus of this initiative looks like. Uh, make sure that the intended you know, consumers, so that your customers, that the producers, so your team, your sponsors, these could be your management, your investors, whomever, make sure they embody the vision before proposing any structures, strategies, or plans. When you start to make things tangible sooner than they need to be, you're drawing the attention away from building that consensus into discussions around structures. So if you go to a team member and say, hey, I'd like you to report to this other person before they really understand the, you know, the census of what we're trying to do, the purpose before they've embodied it, 
they're going to start to ask questions like, well, I, you know, I don't like that person, right? Or I, I don't think he understands what I'm, you know, my strengths are, or you're going to find all these, you know, debates and discussions. And I've seen so much time wasted of people arguing about plans or strategies or structures. And I'm sitting there and I'm realizing that, you know, people in this room don't actually understand what the purpose of what we're trying to do is. And so you might think you're getting ahead by, you know, drafting plans and UX and architecture and, you know, team structures and, you know, all these things, but you're really not actually getting ahead because all you're doing is opening up a can of worms to debate and discuss all those things uh, before people even understand why they're working on this project. And make sure to understand the motives of each key participant in the project. So it could be that people have different motives, but it still makes sense to collaborate and achieve uh, the end goal. But the reason I bring this up is because circumstances are constantly changing. And if you believe that somebody is working on this because they want the same future state, but like I said earlier, maybe they just want a promotion and that's, that's all they're looking to get out of this. Well, ideally you'd have somebody you know, who believes in the vision, but it's okay if they don't, so long as you understand their motives and so long as you can observe that the motives, you know, uh, given the circumstances, the motive still makes sense. So uh, again, ideally everyone's motive is the future state because they want to see it realized. But reality is that you're going to have all kinds of different motives in play. And what's key for you as a product manager, as a leader is to understand why people's motives are currently complementary and what the circumstances would be where their motives would actually direct them to a different direction, right? Or, or make them not want to participate in what you guys are doing. So make sure that the team believes that the idea can be realized before beginning to rationalize it or actually realize it. So this is another one where if, if you, and, and, if you look at how uh, to build, build a belief, right? So what I like to do is, you know, when we state what we're trying to accomplish, I like to just ask, like, does anyone, you know, think we can't achieve this, right? And it's a good place to detect, like, where people's fears or inhibitions or worries are coming from. And you, you'll, come, you'll come up with things like, Oh, I, no, I think we can do it. I just don't think we have enough team members to pull it off, right? So, so that's great. You want to hear those things because those are the things that are challenging people's beliefs. And you want to understand what stands in the way before you, having, uh, before you can have a team that is committed to actually executing. Because once they believe it's possible, that's the state of mind that you want them to go into planning with. You don't want to go into trying to rationalize a plan and rationalize means, uh, you know, determine the different ratios, right? So like, you know, rationalization could be what kind of an architecture would we need? How many servers and things like that, right? And definitely before realization, which is you actually standing up servers and, and starting to build the product. So before you get to the rationalization and realization, make sure where people's inhibitions to believing that an idea could be realized are and address those things. So it might be something that, Hey, I don't think uh, our president is going to approve us working on this. Well, get the approval before you start designing it. And when you go to get that approval, make sure you have that Genesis and terminus and the benefits of it extremely clearly uh, defined. And if in, and then to them, you might find out that the president says, yeah, I like the idea of the project. I like what you guys are after. I just don't think, you know, I don't know if you guys can pull it off. Right. And so then you find yourself in a situation where you have to effectively normalize everybody, whether it be, you know, you know, or he might say, or she might say, Hey, I don't know if customers really are willing to pay for that. Right. So you have to really kind of do the rounds. And this is why I said your story is going to be told hundreds of times because you have to do the rounds to address everyone's concerns and, and inhibitions that prevent them from believing the idea can be realized before you spend the time to make it tangible. And I know that this sounds contradictory or, or counterintuitive, 
because most people think that, hey, by making this more real, I am going to help people believe it's possible. But the part that you're making more real might not have anything to do with the part that prevents somebody from believing it's possible, right? So somebody's beliefs might be concerns around the market wanting to pay for this thing. You building it isn't going to solve that, right? Like you have to first address those belief uh, questions before you go through and invest time and energy. And again, this goes back to the principle that things are a lot cheaper to address while they're in your you know, in the thought domain, in the intangible domain, than they are when you start to apply real resources in real time to them. So definitely do the rounds and figure out where the concerns are about beliefs before beginning to work on it. The other thing is nobody's ever gonna sit you down as a PM and tell you, hey, as a PM, it's your job to do these things, right? This, so this is what I'm talking about where I think the industry is totally unaware. I think that you just have to, and, but most people, I think intuitively, they can tell when there's something wrong on a project and maybe they can't put their finger on what it is, but you, you know, maybe you guys have already been parts of projects that are just not succeeding and there's something wrong about it and you can't quite tell what it is, but it just doesn't seem like people are on the same page. Well, nobody's ever going to pull you aside and be like, Hey, you're a PM. It's your job to build consensus go do it, right? And nobody's gonna ever sit you down and break down the task for you and be like, hey, here's how you build consensus. So you have to just do it because it has to be done. And, and don't worry about needing to have the authority to do this work because ironically, the authority comes from doing this work. When you are the person that people notice building the consensus, you're going to start, you're basically inserting yourself, and I'll have a diagram for this. You're inserting yourself at the core of that network, and that's what gives you the authority to then route and, and control the network. And, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But the key point here is nobody knows whose job this is. Everyone thinks it's the generic leader's job to do this. Nobody carries the title of leader, right? This is something, you, it's a role that you assume when a project becomes embodied into you, you have to self-select to take the role of wanting to be the consensus builder because it has to be done. And if it doesn't get done, I guarantee you your project's not going anywhere. And lastly, be careful of people who want to appear to make more progress by trying to get tangible quickly, right? So I've seen this a ton of times where, you know, it's like, hey, let's, you know, let's, put together a proof of concept and we'll show it and it's going to be great. And then people put together a proof of concept. They show it to people. It gets everyone excited because they think, wow, we're really making great progress here. We're really on track. But again, if you haven't built the appropriate census, you're very likely going to be missing one of the dimensions and it's going to be critical and it's probably going to torpedo your project. Uh, because if you haven't sat down and thought it through, it's easy to get excited. You know, people in the software industry, they, we really like to see things happening. We like to see tangible things happening. I've been guilty of this too. And all you're doing is taking questions that haven't been answered and postponing them. And then finally, when they do reappear, it's gonna be, it's gonna blow up in your face because you're gonna have wasted time and energy that could have been not wasted. And, and sadly, I think a lot of those things get written off because in software, I would say probably anecdotally, what I've observed is that 70 to 80% of the projects don't succeed. Like they don't even cover their costs. And so that's become a status quo thing. Nobody questions why that is the case. People just kind of brush it off and say, oh, well, you know, some projects fail, that's life. More often than not, projects get delayed. Um, drastically delayed, take two times, three times, four times longer. And it's because people are trying to build things without having a consensus on the purpose of what they're trying to build, or they have an in, incoherent structure that's trying to manifest something that hasn't been appropriately embodied by the members of the team. So trust me, don't make this, this mistake. It's, a, it's sadly a mistake that even you know, seasoned experts make but if you can avoid this mistake, that would be great. 
So forming a structure, when we look at that, so this is what I'm talking about. The, the people that first understand the purpose and that want to own the purpose, right? Naturally, people want PMs to own the purpose, right? Your job is to define a future state, to, to actually, sorry, understand the current state, define a future state and get us there. Like that's, and that future state needs to be better than the current state. And that's literally your job as a product manager. And if you can't do that, uh, you know, then you shouldn't be a product manager. And if you can do that, you're going to be a great product manager. It's, it's that straightforward. And so when you build a structure around that, first, it could be you alone. It could be you with a business partner. It could be you with a customer. It could be you with an engineer. It could be a variety of the initial seed, like the initial people that start to assemble that census. And then you guys need to figure out, okay, we have a current state. We have a desired future state. Let's go through the exercise and figure out what transitional states would we be at, right? And so one, you know, and these are super flexible. So I can't prescribe any states for any project because it's very project specific. And it's up to you to define these things. They're nebulous. You can have the same project, the same, you know, current and future state, and you can, you know, have different people come up with different transitionary states. And this is a whole art to deciding what state you're in and to decide what states you should go through. But very kind of broadly and coarsely, you might have a situation where you say, okay, we have a current state. The first thing we're going to do is do a cu customer survey or customer analysis to, you know, uh, be able to clearly define what the pro problems are. The second state is we're going to define a set of requirements that, you know, explain the future state. The third one, we're going to make a click through uh, prototype of the UI that we're going to validate against customers. The fourth one, we'll build the code and so on and so on, right? So you can, you define what those transitionary states are. And my only advice there would be to pick states that have clear endings, right? That you can declare that you say, hey, we've achieved this step and we're now going to the next step. And this is where you're going to hold the line as a product manager. And, and I'll talk about this in just a minute about those state transitions. And then, you know, always keep in mind who are going to be the beneficiaries, the consumers um, of this project, this product. Uh, and it doesn't have to be customers. It could be users that don't pay. It could be internal. It could be your own team. It could be uh, sh shareholders, stakeholders. It could be anyone. But you should have a very clear understanding and intent of who benefits from transitioning between the current state to the future state. And then your next step is gonna to be to start embodying a set of team members and owners for each of these transitionary states, right? There might be somebody who owns the research, somebody who owns the UX, somebody who owns the architecture, right? So start to think about who are you going to hold accountable for those various transitions and who is going to be responsible for declaring that the state to be completed. And at this point, you have to have a line of accountability between the people who own the census, the purpose, generally the PM, but could be PM plus others and could even be others and not even a PM included, right? So very, again, flexible and open-ended, you know, based on each organization. But those people, that are in charge of transitioning from current to future have to be accountable to the people that benefit from the future because they are the ones that you're doing this for. Secondarily, the people that are going to be owning the various states need to be accountable to the people who are owning that purpose. And so this is what I'm talking about. If you are the purpose owner, that inherently starts to give you an authority that you get to control what is happening. And similarly, the consumers, the intended consumers, you need to delegate authority to them to instruct you on their desires. So you, you cannot be dictating, you're accountable to them. They can dictate to you or they can just tell you the truth, 
and you can use that truth to imagine a better truth for them and then be accountable to them for realizing it. And it's their satisfaction. It's their happiness. It's their, um, you know, it, they are your success. It's pleasing them that, that is your success. And so at this point, these owners of the various transition states, they can start to recruit others who are going to be accountable to them to achieve that state. So for example, if you guys need to stand up servers, there might be somebody in procurement or in the data center that now needs to be accountable to them to achieve that. And let here, you know, this is a, a matter of opinion, but I believe that loosely uh, assembled structures, A, they happen faster, B, when people are bought into what they're doing, it just naturally works out. So generally when I'm the purpose holder or purpose owner, I allow the structure to build on its own. It's like, in my mind, it's like, you know, ice, uh, water molecules crystallizing and they just start to spread. Let people who are accountable to you find relationships of people that are going to be accountable to them for their dependencies for the areas that they own. Don't try to micromanage it. It's literally impossible. So just allow anyone. I always come to with the approach of saying anyone who wants to help me make this purpose come true is welcome here and we'll find a role for you and you're going to plug into the structure that we've established to basically help us achieve that vision. And so at this point, this is kind of what I think of as, as the embodiment boundary. So the one thing you need to do as the purpose owner is you need to make sure that the people who are now starting to contribute understand the same purpose that everyone else has. So we all have to be part of the same goal of achieving it. And again, it doesn't hurt. It, it's very, it's very cheap for you to go and embody somebody into your initiative. And that's why, again, going back, you're going to have to tell that same story of what we're doing, why we're doing it, the transitionary states. You're going to have to tell that over and over and over and over. And you should do it with every new member that joins so that we can all have that coherent, same co consensus. And at this point, people will start to bring in tools and materials. And those will be part of the structure to let people naturally uh, figure out what's best. Obviously, as a company, you might have guidelines, you know, but and you might have preferred platforms and you might have certain skill sets internally and, and just let people figure out what they need to be successful in their role. If trust me, if they understand what you're trying to accomplish and why their ability to select what they need is going to be extremely efficient and it's going to work itself out. You don't need to sit there and, and micromanage what is being used or to what degree, let people figure it out. Now, at this point, you start to kind of build and sense this purpose gravity. You start to feel like there's all this attention on what you guys are doing. And at this point, your census has to be good. And the way you know your census is good is because people are almost like volunteering or wanting to join your initiative. You start to attract more people wanting to be part of it, which is a great sign that what you've done is, is hit the census. You've, you've, you've achieved a census because people are naturally gravitating towards wanting to join your initiative. And this could be customers and this could be marketers and this could be sales and this could be other groups start to say, hey, I want to take you and this in front of our customers. Hey, I want to make a campaign about this. Hey, I want to put this on our website, right? And that's, that's a wonderful sign. Or, hey, I would love to be an engineer and work on your team, right? Like all these things are great signs that you have achieved this. And people, you'll believe me, people are going to naturally want to work on your initiatives if you do this right. And then your embodiment boundary is going to grow. Like people will start to, in, you know, include more people to come work with you. And at this point, you, you start to realize that all that's happening is you've kind of created a, a gravitas that society has decided they want to invest their time and resources into your purpose. And so you're going to start to attract uh, such a wide pool of investment that, you know, again, it's most likely will come to you as a surprise until you do this successfully a few times. And before you know it, you, you know, you'll know what to look for. 
But keep in mind that there are two circumstances that could be dangerous. One is there are bad actors out there. I call them pirates. Maybe they're not intentionally bad. Maybe they're not evil or inhumane or immoral or anything. But there are people who are looking at what you've built and they're looking at it as something that could serve their purpose. And again, it could be that their purpose is also a great purpose. But wanting to modify your purpose is going to become an intentional action that others start to take. And that you have to be extremely careful of that because some people will want to modify your purpose for personal gain. Some will want to, you know, modify it for their own initiatives gain. Others will want to, you know, extract uh, more revenue at the expense of serving your customer. Like there's going to be all kinds of actors to start to look at what you're creating and start to look for ways that it could be applied to serve their purpose. And so those are, you know, little unhappy faces I've drawn in, in red here. And also be careful of people that join your initiative without being embodied, which means that they haven't accepted the purpose at an emotional level within them. So they're, they're kind of, you can think of them as people that are just, just doing their job, right? Or just doing one little thing here or there. Because enough of those little infractions can, all, can destabilize your structure and can really start to create derivative structures that aren't plugged into your purpose. So just be careful with that and invest the time to properly onboard people to your purpose. And also there might be, you know, people that are floating around uh, that aren't actually, you know, necessarily plugged in anywhere. And they're just kind of present to what's happening without being part of the structure. And they also do, Kind of they're neutrals, right? But they still do destabilize your structure because they are, you know, impeding uh, amongst the people who are plugged in. So again, make sure that you take care of really embodying what you're doing with every member, and that you expel people who don't actively serve that purpose, or who intentionally, who don't intentionally serve that purpose. So if you take away the materials, take away the bad actors and everything, and just look at the relationships here. Your structure will naturally emerge. Again, I like to do it organically to let people kind of onboard at their own pace. But ultimately what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the people who you're serving at, at the top of the structure. It's for them we're doing it. Then just below them, you're gonna have the people who are owning and controlling the purpose the people that are in charge of the census, the consensus. And then you're gonna have an accountability chain, potentially multiple levels wide, that then plugs in to the people who own the purpose. And it's important that your structure looks like this, and this is what healthy structures look like. Anything other than this, where people have accountability chains of, you know, across each other and stuff, it's, you know, it, it Maybe in, to a small degree where you have, you know, hey, I need to complete my, like I said earlier, design so you can do your UI, but that's, that's very different um, than, you know, they are now trying to drive their own purpose. Um, there's a purpose structure that needs to be there that looks like this. So I mentioned that somebody must control the structure and the census, right? And this might come across as a very authoritarian statement. But it really isn't, right? Because if you look at the word control, again, it's a Latin der der derived word, uh, which comes from contra uh, rato tolu, right? Which is counter role or, or counter role. Again, it sounds the same, but in one case, it's a like a rolling, think of it as a snowball effect, so where things just roll naturally in one direction. Uh, and then in the other case, it's a role like what you're you know, purposes on the team, like your participation and, and what you do, what, what you kind of act out. So projects will naturally, and this is again, extremely important to understand, they will naturally roll somewhere. Things will just kind of snowball and pick up momentum and people will start adding stuff and changing stuff and decisions will be made and things will just naturally go somewhere, right? It's like water going down the hill, it'll find a path. And as feedback cycles develop, you know, people will start to just really kind of accelerate the rolling into some direction. 
but a naturally rolling project, I have at least never seen it end up where a consumer or customer needs it, right? It's, there's this moment at the end where it's like, okay, we've launched it finally. And then it's like, okay, now let's tell sales about it. And you take it to sales and they're like, what the hell is this? You know, and they take it to the customer and the customer's like, what the hell is this? This is like incoherent. And, and usually it's because people just let the project roll somewhere. And I've seen PMs that just kind of go along for the ride, right? And, that, and that's a, I think that's a deadly mistake to make on a project. Like a leader, especially a PM, must be the counterforce to ensure that the destination of the project is its objective goal, right? And so this is, again, why if you state the purpose, now you know where you're trying to get this project to end up. And it's your job to make sure that you're constantly applying the counter pressure, the counter force that ensures that that project doesn't just roll off in some random direction or that somebody can't manipulate it into rolling off into a direction that suits them, but that it actually rolls to the place where people want it. And the rolling effect, you can think of it as like every day we come in is a cycle, right? Every day people work on it. There's these daily cycles, you know, due to the universe that are happening that we're picking up momentum in. And it's important that on a daily basis, you're adjusting that momentum in the right direction. And so this is things like, you know, outlining the states, right? So if we're gonna achieve the UX design before we do the UX work, right? And then again, I don't mean to sound like I'm saying you should do waterfall, right? Like you can achieve a part of the UX before you do a part of the UI development, right? Like you design what these transitions are for you. And they could be very small and there could be very many of them, or you can keep a macro. I found that it's best to keep them as macro as possible and let the, let the team determine their own micro states within there, but you are governing the macro state of the project. So anyways, outlining the states and maintaining the state transitions and being very explicit about declaring when you've transitioned is a way to keep a project on a path. Another, and, and controlling those progressions saying, hey, we're now moving. Um, a procurement of ingredients and, and substitutes. So this is again, where to con if you're going to be controlling a project, you have to be responsible for figuring out, well, what ingredients do we need to keep this project on track? And I, I use ingredients kind of in a cooking way here, but it's really, you know, what skills do we need on the team? To what degree, what tools, what, you know, platforms, you know, whatever you need. Um, what do you need to actually accomplish this? And in some cases where things are prohibitive or too expensive, look for substitutes, right? And so make sure that the team has what it needs to be able to get to this destination. Uh, qualifying and quantifying outcome, that's a huge one. So if you are saying that, hey, our goal is to satisfy our users, figure out what that means and, and put some quantitative or qualitative uh, you know, measurements that can be constantly applied to tell you that you're moving in the right direction. And if you don't do this, your project will just naturally roll in some direction and it won't even be clear where it is or how far it is from the objective goal. And declaring completion, right? So saying, hey, we actually hit that objective goal. Now it's time to reassess what the new current state looks like and what the new desired state looks like and, and basically restart the cycle from scratch. And again, nobody will ever tell you that this is your job. Just do it because somebody has to do it. Don't worry about needing the authority. The authority comes from doing it. And when people see that you're the one that's focusing on this and that you're taking care of this and that you're invested and that you feel like it's your purpose to make this future state come true, you will naturally get authority. And this is where, you know, this is the whole, um, cross-functional leadership that everyone always talks about, how PMs naturally build this authority without actually having people report to them directly. And that's a great model. Again, that's for another talk, but the authority comes from owning the transition from the current to the future state. And if you're invested in it, people will naturally give you the authority to control things. So some advice on structures. So make sure people are accountable for reaching the future state. 
are at the core and in control of the census, right? Like don't let people who are not responsible for getting us to the future state be in charge of dictating what we're doing or why we're doing it or, you know, measuring where we are and things like that. It just, it's best to have the owner, whoever is responsible for that future state, own driving the consensus. Uh, outline the conceptual states that sit between the current state and the future state. Again, this is, it's really hard to convey this in this talk because it's an art, it's its own uh, talk and it's very project specific, but you should at least have what you think are the right progressive states, uh, you know, five, 10, 15 states between where you are and the future. And you should definitely share that with your team and make sure you guys have an agreement and a consensus on what those states should be. Uh, and each state must serve as a conclusion of action, right? With the final ultimate terminus being the desired future. So make sure that there's an accountable owner for reaching each intermediary state. Allow participants, again, this is a subjective opinion, but personally I've found much more success when you allow people to start building their own substructures, to recruit others, to just pick their own tools, uh, determine their own approaches, right? So long as they understand what we are doing and the purpose of why. It's, this can be extremely dangerous if you don't have that consensus because what ends up being something that's so powerful and contributes so much value can actually deter and destroy value because people are working with different assumptions or with a different purpose. So be careful to make sure that people have really embodied the purpose before you uh, grant this liberty. Um, ensure that the census is transcending through people into a physical manifestation. So basically, make sure you build that consensus, make sure people embody it, and then it can transcend into becoming something physical and tangible in the world. And that where it lands, where you stop, that's your desired future state. Uh, measure in an observable way that the purpose is being fulfilled. Like this is so key because it, without this, you just start rolling in a direction. And nobody knows where you're going. Uh, keep the pirates away. These are the people that want to plunder your purpose and use it for themselves. And remember that the ideal future state will never perfectly transcend. So whatever you imagine, it's never going to end up being what you imagine. It's, but it should be close and ultimately, it should be better than what is today. And if you do that over and over, if you make the world better than it is today for those people that you serve, your customers, your consumers, your, the people that you're doing this all for, when you see them apply your work and live in that future state, that's the ultimate satisfaction. Um, and that's ultimately why we, as PMs, that's our, that's our reward. And if that's, that's to me, that's the happiest day in my life is when I see people use a new version of software or a new piece of software and they're just happy and they love it. And they're so excited um, because you've made their life better. And that's ultimately what it boils down to. So with that, that's it. Um, thank you for, for attending today. Hopefully uh, there's some pragmatic advice that you can take out of this and apply. Um, and if you'd like to, you know, continue the conversation, uh, here's my email. Feel free to shoot me an email and uh, I'd love to talk to you more about this. With that, uh, enjoy the rest of your day.